the floor is yours. So good morning, everyone. Um, so we finally, you know, for successfully reached the final day of what to me has been a very productive uh, week. Um, and I hope also for you. And uh, now today, uh, my plan is to be, to go through all the topics which we kind of didn't cover uh, in these lectures in a, in a rather shallow way. Um, so there won't be any detailed calculations. Uh, but I will spend the first part uh, talking about blazers uh, in some detail, and then I'll just go through all the other sources which I haven't. Oops, sorry, I see that my uh -huh, okay, uh, which we haven't talked about uh, quite quickly. Um, okay, so let's uh, and uh, because our last lecture was on Tuesday, I've just put the final slides of, the, of Tuesday's lectures here, just to remind everybody the context for this uh, blazer neutrino emission. So here I wanted to remind everyone that because we have uh, the spectrum with uh, two peaks possibly being produced by a single uh, particle population, uh, often we can determine the magnetic field strength and maybe you also played around with this a bit in the hands-on um, exercise, which we can decide and discuss later. So we can often guess the magnetic field strength, the Doppler factor of the emission. Um, here I just put the Lorentz factor. Uh, and also because these are variable sources, we can tell something about the size of the region, which puts the blazers uh, easily in the ballpark of uh, producing ultra high energy cosmic rays. And uh, we have neutrino production in the jet as long as there are photons, which we do observe. So there are photons inside the jet, uh, traveling with the jet at uh, relativistic speeds. There are also photons associated to the black hole surrounding the black hole, uh, and also maybe other photon fields surrounding the jet. So there are several possibilities. And uh, we get uh, basically a, a neutrino flux, which is uh, similar to the gamma ray flux we get from neutral pi and decay. And I, I pointed out on, on Tuesday that we have a characteristic shape of the, of the neutrino spectrum, which is very peaky, very peaked. Uh, uh, and this is um, possibly a problem if we want to describe the ice cube data, but it is definitely a problem if we want to describe the ice cube data uh, with these standard uh, canonical blazer models. Uh, and we also saw that actually most of them, uh, the peak of the neutrino emission from blazers is even in the energy range beyond where ice cube is, uh, is sees the, the majority of the flux, but there are limits there from ice cube. And I finished by saying that, in fact, if we look at the positions of the known brightest blazers, uh, at least in gamma rays, we just we know a few thousand of them, uh, there are no neutrinos in these directions, and Ice Cube has placed an upper limit to the stack, you know, from stacking to the total contribution of blazers uh, to the Ice Cube flux of order 17%. And I mentioned that this kind of already breaks our picture that maybe a single population could be responsible for all the high energy emissions we observe because blazers are responsible for the overwhelming for the most of the, of the gamma rays that we, we observe in the universe. Okay, but then yesterday you heard from Ilaria about this particular event, which was um, and a high energy neutrino, we said that the high energy neutrino has individually a high chance of being astrophysical in origin. This one was about 60% uh, chance of being astrophysical just by virtue of its energy. And uh, uh, every time one of these is uh, detected in ice cube, ice cube generates a public alert. So not just to, to magic, but everybody in the world, you can subscribe and get an email um, and then the Fermi uh, advocates for, for following these things up, checked quickly the what's in the field of view of this neutrino and found a powerful blazer, Texas 050 
And what was remarkable was that this blazer was flaring in gamma rays. So this is the, the gamma ray flux over 10 years as seen with Fermi, pretty quiet source. And then a few months before the arrival of the neutrino, which is shown with this orange dashed line, the source had started undergoing its most major flare that we've seen in 10 years. Um, and the chance probability to see such a neutrino of such energy uh, associated with the gamma ray, with the blazer with gamma ray flux as high or higher uh, is 0.3%. So this is a three sigma uh, effect. This was the first source to be associated with an ice cube. A neutrino at such high uh, significance. And what's more is that then the ice cube collaboration looked at archival data from the same direction in the sky. And, and, and what they found was that this uh, direction, in this direction, there were basically no neutrinos if in the first years of ice cube operation. And then there was a cluster of 13. Um, high energy neutrinos in 2014 to 2015 in a period of six months. Uh, and then uh, in, in 2017, there was the other high energy event. So that cluster of events is also interesting. Statistically speaking, this is a, um, I, I don't have it here, but it's almost 3.5 sigma. So the, this is another rare, uh, statistically rare event to see such a cluster of events in such a short time uh, in this direction in the sky. And um, now if we look at what the, the blazer was doing in terms of gamma rays, it was doing basically nothing. It was very quiet during that time. Um, so, okay, this generated really a lot of uh, attention and uh, it's very exciting. I am one of the people that worked a lot on, on, on this, on the modeling side, um, but a huge number of people worked a lot on this. Uh, so let's see uh, why this is interesting because I just said that actually blazers don't produce all the ice cube neutrinos. However, um, blazers flare and during flares, they, blazers increase their flux by factors of 10 or even 100. This is Markarian 501. This is the nearest blazer to Earth uh, at the distance of about 100 megaparsec. And during this particular flare, you see here how in gray, how it looks on a quiet day. And then during this red, uh, this was a day uh, when this source was um, about 100 times more bright than it otherwise is. Um, so this is an example of a flare. And now what, let's think about what happens when there is a flare. So it's natural to think that if for some reason the emission, uh, the electrons are more in the source and if there are protons, they should be also enhanced during the flare. Uh, more protons means more neutrino production. Now what's more than that is that the photons, which we see here, are part of the, the target of the experiment, right? Where we have uh, photopion production. So we might have even a nonlinear increase of the, of the number of neutrinos. So that's, what this means is that maybe the source produces very few neutrinos. And then during the flare, it becomes a, you know, a hundred or even a thousand times more powerful in terms of neutrinos and then ice cube or other neutrino detectors have a good chance to detect a transient event. And then the flares can last a day, they can last a year. We observe all kinds of, um, of flaring periods. This is a very interesting uh, process in of itself. And what's shown in this picture is uh, uh, the neutrino spectrum, which we expect from one source when it's in its quiescent uh, state. And then during a flare, indeed, in this model, uh, the, the neutrino flux increase, increases by a factor of 100. Then there is another thing. We saw that, that ice cube has an irreducible atmospheric neutrino background. Uh, and that background, of course, 
if we have long, uh, long durations, that, that background just increases in time. If we have a short time period where we look for neutrinos, we have an experimental advantage because the background is lower. So these are reasons why maybe blazers don't produce all the neutrinos we observe in IceCube, but maybe they're very interesting neutrino point sources when they undergo these intense flares. So what I want to do now is talk about uh, this uh, neutrino production in this particular blazer in 2017. Uh, what you see here is that as soon as the IceCube alert was reported, uh, many groups of uh, uh, theorists took the public data, analyzed it, most of the data are actually public, um, and produced a kind of uh, a spectral energy distribution, so optical data, X-ray, um, and gamma rays. Um, and then they tried, they have uh, codes, uh, you saw one such example in the web page that I suggested, but much, much more sophisticated that fits simultaneously the emission from protons and electrons in the jet. And what everybody tried to do was maximize the neutrino production in this source and see what conditions are required such as to produce neutrinos with uh, energy and flux uh, implied by the observation of one neutrino in ice cube. And so, so these are all the different attempts that came out on the same day. So all these people were working independently. Um, and the conclusion of all these studies was that this blazer can have produced at most uh, 0.01 neutrinos during the six months that the Fermi flare uh, lasted. Now, what does this mean? In principle, this is an okay number. So if I produce, if the expectation value is 0 0.01 neutrinos, then the Poisson probability to, de to detect one neutrino is 1%. And now we know that there are thousands of lasers in the sky. So if they all produce during their flares, this kind of flux, then the first one, which we happen to be by chance, TXS0506, so statistically, this is consistent with the observation of ice cube, but what I want to spend a bit of time discussing is what does it actually take for this particular blazer to produce this uh, neutrino flux? Okay, so, um, and what I wanted to briefly discuss because I think I didn't make it very clear on Tuesday is that when we look at the blazer, we often see only the jet. So what we see here is just non-thermal emission from the jet, but there are so many other photon fields. There is a large, a giant elliptical host galaxy, which we often don't see. Sometimes we can see it uh, from here. It depends where the, the peaks happen to be in the particular blazer of the jet, but often we don't see the host galaxy. We often don't see the photon fields close to the black hole. So this is a kind of semi-free parameter for modeling. So if I want to increase the neutrino production efficiency, as I'm going to explain in the next slide, then I can semi-arbitrarily increase the photon fields until they start to show up in the spectrum. And then that's an, an upper limit, because if they show up, we should have detected them, unless they're in a region where we don't have observations, and then we have a bit more room. Okay, so this is a feature that was used in this modeling, the fact that we can semi-arbitrarily increase the, the photon fields. So let's go through this. So returning to this picture that we're in the jet in an emitting region where we have protons interacting with the photons from the jet or surrounding the black hole, and we have a neutrino and gamma ray production, and we want to have uh, you know, ideal conditions for neutrino production. So we increase the photon field that increases the neutrino production efficiency. Um, but there is a problem here where we can't uh, make this arbitrarily large. And this is the fact that this source was detected with magic. So let's, let me explain this a bit more. So we have at the same time as we have uh, proton interactions with the photons in the source, 
The gamma rays also interact with photons in the source and they produce electron-positron pairs. So they are attenuated. And in fact, these two processes are analogous. What they differ by, so for a given uh, target photon energy, there is a particular proton energy and a particular gamma ray energy where they preferentially interact with this uh, target photon. And, uh, though, and uh, those processes are basically co connected by the ratio of the cross sections of the two processes. So as it so happens, the, the gamma gamma, the gamma gamma process has an, a cross section which is a thousand times larger than the P gamma cross section. So that means that if I try to increase the neutrino production efficiency, which can, we can also see, think of as an optical depth, which is a more astronomer's way to say it, then I'm also increasing the optical depth to gamma rays. Um, so eventually the optical depth to gamma rays becomes too, too large before we have reached the total energy loss for the protons. And the energy where this happens where the connection is, so for a particular target photon energy, a 15 GeV gamma ray feels the same target photons as a 6 PeV proton. Now with magic, we saw these 10 and 100 GeV photons. This means they were not being you know, attenuated inside the source. And this sets one limit to how much we can increase the photon fields inside the source. Now, what else can we do? If we can't increase the efficiency, we can still increase the number of protons. And that's another semi-free parameter for the models. Um, that also increases neutrino production. Uh, however, protons produce not only neutrinos, they also produce electrons and they also produce gamma rays. So if we, for example, we have for this particular source of process, which was very Important was better Heidler pair production. So at the same time as we have neutrino production, we have pair production. And these pairs, once they get produced in the source, they undergo synchrotron, cooling, or inverse Compton interactions. And they basically produce more, more photons. And these photons peak more or less in this X-ray region. So we can increase the proton luminosity until we, we, we overshoot the data. We can't do that. Uh, that gives us an upper limit to the proton luminosity in the source. So, um, and, and then also we have, of course, gamma rays from, from pion decays and they interact inside the source. Uh, they produce electrons and they produce another um, photon cascade, which peaks at uh, MeV energies. Here we don't have any instrument actually at the moment. So in principle, we have a bit more room. So it is all these effects that we have to keep uh, in control. Um, can't overshoot what we measure in terms of photons. We can't attenuate the gamma rays in the source. And this is what led to this upper limit. This is a, a strong upper limit and it's with very generous parameters that's, that is obtained. And it's not possible that all blazers have these kind of parameters. Otherwise, we would be observing um, much more neutrino emission than we actually do today in the universe. So maybe we can conclude that this is a special source or that there is uh, no good physical model on the association. Um, regarding the 2014 neutrino flare, uh, here you can see the black data points are the spectrum that could be Observe, observes for this source. Now, there was no campaign to, to look at the source in detail at that time. There is only archival data and why, that's why the coverage is so poor. And this blue spectrum here is the spectrum that was produced by looking at uh, the 13 plus or minus five uh, neutrinos that IceCube detected. Um, and this is now one attempt to model this source while respecting all the limits from the data and try to maximize the neutrino production efficiency, which is the neutrinos are this black uh, 
curve here. The conclusion of this work and of other work on this topic is that one can produce at most five neutrinos and be consistent with what is measured in terms of photons. If we want to produce more, we basically have to completely overshoot the spectrum. So that's not possible. Now, uh, since this work, there have been other suggestions that maybe somehow there is some gas which absorbs some of the photons we don't observe. Um, there are always ways to make, to fine tune the model more and more, uh, but there is no simple um, physical model for, for these associations. Um, okay, and this is what I wanted to say about flares. Um, I'm going to now switch gears and talk about the rest of the sources which are um, popular candidates for uh, as uh, neutrinos, uh, neutrino producing sources. And I'll go quickly through them, starting with uh, gamma ray bursts. So gamma ray bursts are produced when a, when a massive star uh, is basically dying. So uh, a black hole is formed in the jet during the process. And these uh, events were discovered in, in the middle of the Cold War. So at first, there were thought to be some paranormal activity, which is terrestrial. But then it turned out that these are just cosmological bursts. Um, when one of these gamma ray bursts happens, uh, let's look at the power here. So they only last between a fraction of a second and a few tens of seconds. And one of, one of them happens, they absolutely outshine everything in the gamma ray sky. So um, the energy released is much larger than what we typically see in the most powerful blazers that I talked about before. And there is uh, about a thousand of, them, a thousand of them occurring every year in the universe. Now, uh, a pivotal moment for for multi-messenger, for many, many fields uh, in, 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 in astrophysics, but also for uh, gamma ray burst science was when LIGO and Virgo reported the detection of the, the coalescence of a binary neutron star uh, in, in 2017. And within two seconds, the Fermi GBM, that's one of the two instruments on board the Fermi satellite telescope, uh, detected the short gamma ray burst. So then there was a big observational campaign with optical telescopes to try to localize the source and the host galaxy was found within uh, 40 megaparsecs. So um, that was a pivotal moment because that provided concrete uh, you know, proof that uh, uh, these short gamma ray bursts are related to these uh, binary mergers. Um, it was previously thought to be the case, but this was just a, a very beautiful confirmation of that model. Whereas long gamma ray bursts happen when a single star dies and then there is a kind of uh, what we call a hypernova, a very powerful supernova that happens. Okay, now one very interesting thing about these gamma ray bursts is that they have uh, Lorentz factors much, much larger than what we saw in blazars, and they are of order a thousand for the brightest ones of them. And the way we know this is the same argument as I made before about the attenuation of gamma rays inside the source. So here we have again observation of gamma rays from all these gamma ray bursts. This means that the optical depth cannot be very large. So if we have an optical depth equal to one, the fraction of gamma rays that escape or that escape the source is e to the minus one, so that's about uh, twenty percent. So if we observe the GV gamma rays, the optical depth can be one, it can be two, but it can't be more than that. And so if we then look at the uh, at the energetics of what happens, so when we have uh, pair production when the threshold energy for that to happen is twice the mass of the electron. 
Um, and we have to convert the energies that we observe to energies in moving with the jet of the gamma ray burst. We also know the luminosity of the gamma ray burst. That's what we measure. That allows us to determine the photon density inside the source. It is this expression here. And then how do we know the radius? We know it because this is a very short-lived event. And the radius is basically the travel time. So the, the time of expansion, which comes from the lifetime of, of the GRB. So we put these numbers here. And this is the, the Thomson cross section. Uh, and we require that this optical depth be not much larger than one. This gives us a, a limit, a lower limit on the Lorentz factor to be of order a few hundred or a thousand. And so what could we have neutrino production in these GRBs? Um, this is uh, many people have worked on this. This is a very popular candidate source. Uh, Mauricio is one of the people that have worked on this in a, in a previous life. <laughs> and and, uh, and um, basically we have a lot of photon fields in the, in the GRB. This is why it's so bright. Um, and we have possibilities for neutrino production very, you know, almost inside the star or what, if a bit further out, this is what we call when, when we see the GRB or even later on in the afterglow of the GRB. And here we have more time. So we might even have the production of uh, 10 to the 18 electron volt neutrinos. So we, we know this process by now. Uh, and if we put the, the threshold energy for the process to occur, uh, for the for pyron production to occur uh, on uh, MEV photons. These are the photons that we observe the most of in a GRB. Uh, and we put a typical Lorentz factor of a few hundred here. Uh, we get PEV neutrinos more or less uh, from this uh, prompt phase of the, of the GRB. Um, so what do we observe? This is one of the important results of IceCube already from the early days. Since GRBs are so short-lived, they're actually quite easy to, to test with IceCube, whether they produce a significant fraction of the IceCube flux, because one can stack the direction and, and look for neutrinos in the directions of the GRBs at the time of the GRB, um, and see if any of the IceCube neutrinos come from those times. So what's shown here is, I put here, the level at which we observe the ice cube neutrino flux and the solid lines are upper limits to what might be produced from these GRBs from the fact that we don't detect uh, any neutrinos from, from them. Or maybe there was one neutrino in a, in a sample that included uh, more than a thousand GRBs. And that's why it led to strong upper limits so the conclusion is that at most 1% of the ice cube neutrinos are produced by gamma ray bursts. Uh, and in fact, what you see here, these dashed lines are predictions from some of the most canonical um, models of where we would expect the neutrino emission from GRBs. And you see that the upper limit for, for these two, the red and the blue is actually below the model prediction. So these models are constrained, this IC mark model still survives. It predicted very few neutrinos. So it doesn't mean that GRBs don't produce neutrinos. It just means they don't produce the majority of the neutrinos that IceCube sees. OK. Um, now let me move on to tidal disruption events. Just a brief moment. So these are some very interesting events as well. Um, and the, uh, what happens here is that tidal disruption events were um, predicted in the 70s because it was realized that every supermassive black hole in the center of a galaxy is surrounded by star clusters. And so that what's basically there is billions of stars in random orbits. Um, and so once in a while, a star might come in on a trajectory which is just right, that it doesn't get swallowed immediately by the black hole, 
but for, for a while the tidal forces are stronger than the self-gravity of the star. So the star gets disrupted and a stream of debris basically start to rotate the, to orbit the black hole. So it was predicted that such an event should happen every, in, for every supermassive black hole every 10,000 to 10 to the nine years. Um, and this is a picture of, of what happens. So the, the, the star comes in this way. This is a black hole and the debris start to orbit the black hole. Eventually, in some cases, an accretion disk can form, as you can imagine, after a few orbits. Um, and so the emission from these events is observed and it peaks in X-rays. Um, now, how do we detect them? Uh, probably these events happen in all kinds of galaxies, but when we have an AGN, the AGN has its own very variable activity, so it's almost impossible to know when a tidal disruption event happened. But if we have a quiet galaxy where nothing really happens, and then we see such an intense um, explosion with a, with a light curve, which is characteristic not of a supernova, but what one expects from a tidal disruption event, this is how we have detected most of those events until today. Um, and we don't know so many. I wrote here optimistically that we know almost a hundred. That's a kind of overestimate, but it's in the high, I don't know, 50 or 60 by now. And by now we're detecting about 10 per year because there is a new, very large optical uh, survey called the Zwicky Transient Survey. Um, so they detect about 10 per year. Now, in a few cases, I mentioned that an accretion disk can form and in a few cases, we can have um, uh, a jet launched, much like we have in an AGN. We have an accretion disk and eventually a jet coming out in the polar direction. So it's a mini AGN jet. Uh, and so far, three such cases with a jet have been detected. And why is that exciting? Well, if we have a jet, we have a good place for it, where in principle, we could have high energy particle acceleration, possibly high energy proton acceleration. So in fact, in 2016, there was the observation of a kind of a very lucky, very interesting uh, jet tidal disruption event with SWIFT, the name is here. Actually, it was not in 2016, I think that's just uh, right ascension of the source. It was a few years before that. Uh, in any case, that doesn't matter. Uh, but this was basically a, a beautiful event and it was observed in blazer mode, meaning that we were able to see directly into the jet of the, of the tidal disruption event. Um, and uh, because there was modeling done of the, of the spectrum of the source, uh, what was concluded is that the magnetic field and the you know, the Lorentz factor was of order 10 and the magnetic field uh, and the radius that were inferred were such that it is thought that at the early stages of the, of the tidal disruption event, uh, the conditions were such that it's imaginable that uh, 10 to the 20 electron volt cosmic rays could have been produced in this event, uh, or at least confined as we said before, based on the HILAS condition. Uh, but this only lasted a, a short time. After a while, the Lorentz factor drops uh, below something. Okay. Um, now, could it be that the tidal disruption events are producing uh, many of the neutrinos that we observe? Um, the answer is no. So maybe tidal disruption events are producing neutrinos and the way they might produce neutrinos is again, uh, photopion production. So we have all these photon fields similar to an, to an AGN for some fraction, for some small uh, time duration. Um, but there is a problem. And the problem is that the inferred rate of tidal disruption events is very small. So you might remember this plot from Tuesday, and they are extremely, especially the 
tidal disruption events of HAP jets are uh, extremely rare. And uh, since we don't detect any uh, you know, strong significance, we can conclude that they cannot be producing the majority of the ice cube neutrinos. If we don't require the presence of a jet, then they're almost 100 times more numerous. Uh, they would be sitting somewhere here. So maybe they're marginally consistent with producing uh, quite a few neutrinos. But theoretically, when there isn't a jet, it's harder to, to come up with where and if uh, 10 to the 17 electron volt protons get accelerated. There are some options. There is also a limit from ice cube. Um, and I encourage you to, any of you that have access to the ICRC, um, all the limits that I quote uh, in these lectures this week are likely going to be updated next week at the International Cosmic Ray Conference. So these limits might improve. Uh, so do keep an eye out. Um, or when the proceedings things get uploaded to the uh, archive eventually. But in the previous ICRC, a, a search, a stacking uh, search for neutrinos from known tidal disruption events led to the conclusion that at most 1% are produced by the jetted ones, and at most 26% could be consistent with being produced by non jetted ones. Okay. Um, now, however, in 2019, there was the observation of one high energy neutrino because of its energy, 200 TV. This is approximately six. Uh, there is a question. So there is a question by Nele. Uh, how good are physicists now in distinguishing what's the origin of the neutrino they detect? Is there anything else they take into account besides the energy. Mm. Nele, there is the arrival direction, of course. Um, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Do you mean in terms of arrival direction or? Um, there is nothing in the shape of, of the, you know, of the detection that would tell us if it, ah. Yeah, so I, I was just, I mean, I think the most like important one you take into account is the energy, right? If you want to distinguish like what is, what produced that neutrino, because if you see your neutrino in your detector, uh, and I, I guess in, in, at first you don't know where it from, comes from, so you have to find out where it comes from, right? Uh, and as far as I understand, one of the most important things is probably the energy because uh, then you can see, okay, I have this source that uh, produces neutrinos at, in this range. Um, but uh, so the question is maybe like, how is there overlap between different sources such that you maybe don't always know um, that a neutrino at this energy has for, to be for sure like from such an event? Uh, and also, I mean, okay, so maybe the direction, uh, if, if you know that some event is at some place in the sky. Um, so that was just a, a question if there's anything else. Okay, thanks very much. I, 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 now I understand your question better. So yes, the, there is the energy. And one thing which I didn't mention much, but is very important is which part of the sky. So a different declinations in the sky, a different energy means different things in terms of how much background there is there. So there are certain directions in the sky where um, the, the background is much lower. And that's where the, this astrophysical probability takes that into account, even though I didn't mention it. It's not just a function of the energy. It's a function of signal, versus background in a particular direction in the sky. Now, how many sources are in the one degree region, which is the best we can do with ice cube? A lot. So there is a lot of background, a huge amount of background. But we can only make a probabilistic statement and say, actually, for this particular event, there were four transient sources just in the field of view of this neutrino at the time of the neutrino. Um, 
but not only one of them was a tidal disruption event. And tidal disruption events are so rare, we only know a hundred. So that in itself is a very, you know, is a kind of interesting statistically, but there are also many other candidates. Okay, yes, thanks a lot. Yes. Okay. Great. So um, this particular event, so as I said, there were maybe even more than four, I forget now. There were so many transient events uh, seen in the field of view of this neutrino. Um, but most of them are, you know, like a boring kind of novi or um, supernovae. Uh, and one of them is a tidal disruption event, which is a very rare event. And what's shown here is the, is the light curve in the, in the UV band and also in the X-ray band. So 200 days before the arrival of the neutrino, there was a tidal disruption event and that kept, uh, the emission kept going in the UV, in the X-rays it had already stopped. But what is very interesting about this event is that there was also a radio emission. And radio emission tells us that there are electrons which are relativistic at the very least, and maybe also some signs of a jet. So they, also, you know, the chance probability to find a high energy neutrino in the direction of one of the tidal disruption events that we have seen so far is 0.5%. Now, as it so happens, later this uh, tidal disruption event was studied very carefully with radio observations. And what was determined is that unfortunately, this was not, there was no relativistic jet. We can rule out the presence of a relativistic jet. So this here is uh, the locus of gamma ray bursts in terms of kinetic energy uh, and also how relativistic they are. And this was, actually, I'm not sure what gamma ray sample, the gamma ray burst sample is this, because I would expect this to increase even to higher energy, higher uh, products of gamma beta. Um, but in any case, that clearly has to be here or above. Um, and then this was this canonical swift uh, tidal disruption event with the jet that I mentioned before. So during time, it started up here and became slowly less relativistic. And the yellow points are where this uh, 2019 tidal disruption event was determined to be. And this is together with typical supernovae uh, uh, type one. So uh, likely this does not fulfill the conditions that we need in to, to accelerate particles in a jet. There are still options, as I said, maybe there are some shocks surrounding the event, um, but it's just not the canonical uh, conditions that we expect. I just want to uh, encourage you to keep an eye out because meanwhile, another uh, tidal disruption event has been seen in coincidence with another high energy neutrino and the results have not been published yet. The alerts are public. Now, since I haven't seen anything in the Astronomer's Telegram where people report ex exciting observations, I assume that this source also didn't have a jet. But I say this ag agnostically because I don't know. Maybe someone has fantastic observations and they're writing a paper. So stay tuned and uh, try to think about all these things that uh, I mentioned when you see th those papers come out. Okay, now let me quickly jump to starburst galaxies. We have only 15 minutes. Uh, and that's a totally different type of source, right? So we, we talked about transient sources. Now starburst galaxies are the opposite. These are, they are not particularly long lived. They're only 10 to the eight years, which is a short time for astrophysical uh, time scales. Um, but they are basically steady phenomena, more or less. So in these galaxies, what we have is intense star formation. That means also not only young stars, but also deaths of stars, so explosions, supernovae, gamma ray bursts. And so these supernovae basically are so many that they drive a wind, what's shown here, out from the disk, uh, out of the galaxy, and they have 
a lot of gas uh, and strong magnetic fields. So this means we have a chance to confine cosmic rays for longer in, in, in these galaxies than we do in a normal galaxy. Um, and let me talk briefly about the gas. So here, if we have neutrino production, it could it has to be in interactions of protons with, uh, with a kind of gas, which is almost at rest. Well, actually, it's not because there is a wind, uh, but uh, low energy protons, which form the gas uh, in this source. And uh, then we have pion production with a different ratio of charge to neutral pions than we do uh, in uh, photopion interactions. But otherwise, what's different in this uh, case is that the neutrinos that are produced basically follow the spectrum of the parent protons. So this we have to remember, and maybe you already recognize that so far we've been looking at an ice cube spectrum, which always looks like a power law. So, and we saw that lasers don't produce this kind of power law, for example, or in general, big gamma interactions. So this is an interesting thing to keep in mind. Um, and it, it, it so happens that the conditions are such in a starburst galaxy that maybe they are calorimetric, meaning that protons lose, lose all their energy during the lifetime of the starburst activity. And maybe they could produce all the neutrinos uh, that we predicted when we looked at the waxman back hole bound. Um, and the idea here, there is a, an interesting model called the reservoir model in which uh, ultra high energy cosmic rays get produced preferentially in GRBs in starburst galaxies, just because there are more of them. And they produce a flux of ultra high energy cosmic rays, which eventually escape. Uh, and the lower energy protons get trapped in the magnetic field of the starburst and they have time to basically undergo a lot of uh, interactions and eventually produce a lot of neutrinos. So, um, of course, people have looked at whether it could be that starburst galaxies produce all the neutrinos or a big part of the neutrinos that ice cube sees. Um, and here, I'm really not an expert, uh, but Marcus is one of the people that have worked on this problem. I think let, maybe I summarize how I see this. So the, the, the idea is that we know that what we see here is the gamma ray data, the gamma ray data from Fermi. And we know that the majority of them come from lasers. So what is left is available for starbursts or other sources to try and saturate, but there's very little of it, a uh, few tens of percent at most. And it's shown down here uh, in the red solid line. So, if we try to maximize neutrino production in starburst galaxies and try to saturate the ice cube measurements at the same time we're producing gamma rays and they are eventually in conflict with what's the maximum allowed for um, for non-blazers so now it depends whether we try to explain all the ice cube data or only the high energy data. If we try to, escape, to explain all the ice cube data, we have an absolute problem. And we can at most manage a few percent with the spectrum, which is fixed uh, in these proton-proton uh, interactions of the neutrinos. Uh, now, the, the way I understand it, the most recent work on this said, well, if we forget about the ice cube data down here at low energies, and we just try to fit the high energy data, um, then we can barely do that uh, and explain this high energy data and still not uh, violate the Fermi limits. Uh, but then we need another population of sources at low energies. Okay, so in the I don't know if Marcus already wants to comment or maybe say something. I think we have a bit of time. You, you put it perfectly. I don't have much to add here. Okay. Then uh, in what we, time we have left, I will very quickly talk about pulsars. And I at first thought I would skip pulsars, but uh, there's something very interesting currently going on with pulsars. So I'll briefly mention them. So pulsars are another... Uh, route that uh, massive stars take when they die. 
if their mass is larger than eight times the mass of the sun. And basically, uh, what happens is that we have such extreme density that the electrons and protons merge and then we have a neutronization. So we have a star which had originally 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 kilometers radius, and it collapses down to about 10 kilometer radius. So now we have applying conservation of angular momentum, this leads us to, to, to a basically a spin period, which is below a second. So these are extremely fast spinning objects. And we also want to conserve magnetic flux. So if we started with a star like the, the sun with one Tesla magnetic field, uh, and we imagine it shrinking down to 10 kilometers, we end up with these humongous magnetic fields with about uh, 10 to the 10 Gauss strength, which we don't observe anywhere else in the universe. So in these extreme conditions, there are several possibilities to accelerate high energy particles, either in the electric field of the pulsar. There is also a pulsar wind, which is the remnant from the, from the initially the star was losing a lot of material before it collapsed. And there, there are shocks. And in principle, we can have particle acceleration. And in fact, Fermi has detected a few hundred pulsars in the shown here in, its, in the past 10 years. So why are they interesting? Well, very recently, there has been a series of papers. In fact, the latest one only came out yesterday in Science where what has been reported is the detection of uh, gamma rays with energy up to 1.4 PeV. So, and uh, specifically the biggest instrument who has detected such photons is called LASO. It's a relatively new experiment in, in, in China. This was the first time they reported observations. Um, and they've seen 530 photons with energy be between a few hundred TV and point, one point uh, something uh, PEV from uh, 12 galactic sources. So this is exciting because we've never seen such high energy photons before. And of course they are galactic because if they were extra galactic, they could not reach us because they get attenuated by the interactions or with the with the extragalactic background light. So they could only be galactic at these energies. Now, it's not clear what these 12 sources are, but in the paper, there are possible counterparts listed. Um, and most of them are consistent with the directions of known uh, galactic pulsars. Among them is the Krab pulsar, and this one is the only confirmed uh, association. Uh, another very interesting possible counterpart is the Cygnus Cocoon uh, star form. It's a star forming region. So we talked about starburst, now a mini version of the starburst, the star forming region in our own galaxy. Um, now, what, why is this very exciting? Well, it means that we have acceleration to PV energy in our own galaxy. We don't yet know whether what's accelerated is hadrons or just electrons. But um, LASO claims that within two years, uh, they will be able to study the spectrum from this particular source, the Cygnus region. And based on whether how the cutoff looks, uh, and also based on the morphology, they will be able to, to tell whether the origin is leptonic or hadronic. And of course, if it is hadronic, then we have potentially uh, many sources of 10 PeV protons in our galaxy. That means we expect to eventually detect many sources of uh, 500 TeV um, neutrinos, either with ice cube or we might need to wait for the next uh, incarnation of ice cube. So this is again, very, very new results. And I encourage you to keep an eye out how this field uh, evolves. So I will uh, uh, basically stop here, putting together everything I said in terms of what we know about the sources of the ice cube neutrinos. So here I have put the upper limits that we have from stacking from all these populations that I mentioned. 
and they basically amount to at most 50% of all the neutrinos that ice cube sees. That means that uh, if any of you find the topic interesting, there's certainly a lot of work to find out what are the sources of the remaining at least 50%, maybe more, because these limits will, will shrink. Uh, this is an exciting time. And um, I mentioned already that there are many instruments that are currently being deployed which will have similar size as ice cubes, so different eyes in the sky. Eventually, ice cube will become 10 times larger, so almost 10 times more sensitive. So this is really an exciting uh, new field of research. I didn't have time to talk about ultra high energy neutrinos, which are another very different and interesting thing. Uh, an interesting guaranteed flux of neutrinos, but maybe we can talk about this in the discussion session. And I will stop here. Thank you for your attention. I stopped with this uh, first multi-messenger event, which was quite spectacular. And I wish us all more of those events. Uh, yes, and I'm happy to have any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Fotini, for these excellent um, lectures. So this was your last lecture. So I would encourage everyone here on the call to open the microphone and give Fotini a round of applause. Uh, thank you for that. Um, but are there questions? Maybe I can ask a question. Uh, so well, it's, it's, it's more like a comment. Uh, so you mentioned TXS uh, and this, this one event that we observe compared to, what was it, 0.01 events per six months. Um, there, there have also been some arguments that, uh, you know, you can use the Eddington bias uh, that, well, if you have many sources in the universe, then if you, if you have 100 sources that individually expect 0.01 event. Maybe maybe you want to comment on that, Fotini? Uh, you're, you're, you're muted at the moment. Yes, absolutely. So I actually very briefly mentioned this. So ah, we yeah. have 100 events. If we have an expectation value, tend to, but it's interesting to, to, to talk about it more because it's a very important point. If we have a 0 0.01 events as neutrino expectation, then we have about 1% chance to see one neutrino from each such flare. And maybe we have a few hundred flares in 10 years, that's a reasonable number. So that's perfectly consistent with uh, having one detection in ice cube. Um, in 10 years. Um, so, so not all hope is lost that this is uh, somehow like a misidentified neutrino in 2017. But I guess on the other hand, the, this larger flare in 2014, then of course it's difficult then to get like these 13 events, right? You mentioned that you only get something like five neutrinos from models. So that's of course already some statistical tension, I guess. Yes, I mean, the important conclusion for me is that it cannot be a normal blazer. What does that mean? Maybe some really extraordinary event happened, uh, but it won't be repeated by all the blazers that we know. So there are many models that can, in principle, uh, produce even more than 0 0.01 neutrinos if we have multiple zones. Uh, but then we can't wait to see more of those because that, that's such a fine-tuned set, tuned set of conditions. That's my feeling. Does that uh, kind of agree with how you see it? Or yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Any? So, yeah, uh, I have yeah. one one question. Maybe I don't see anybody else. So first, thank you for Tini again. This was wonderful. Uh, my question is about the TDEs. So. Uh, there's, as far as I know, there's only a handful of, of tidal disruption events that have been seen to have a, a confirmed or likely jet, like two or three. And there are some that might have one and there are some that definitely don't. But do, are you aware of what our expectations are for neutrino production from TDEs that are not jetted? 
So are these supposed to be good neutrino producers as opposed to the, I mean, like the jetted ones? Yeah, so, um, so we actually, uh, we in one paper with Kota, we speculated on this, but I, I want to, because this is a lecture, I want to be clear that this is a very, very new field somehow. <laughs> we don't really know much about these non-jetted TDs. There are possibly shocks around the, the, the event where there can be high energy neutrino production. If the magnetic field is right in the region of the shock, if the shock is long lived enough, even if there isn't a jet. So what we observed so far is consistent with there being like you know, an accretion disk, even if there wasn't a jet. And so there is a possibility to produce high energy protons. But the first idea of why people were so excited about the tidal disruption events was the fact that there was a jet, because there it's obvious how you have shocks in the jet. So it's more speculative, but it's definitely possible. Um, the flux, there is another problem, which is that, that we lose a, um, you know, a gamma to the fourth from the boost. So that puts prop, you know, energetic problems to individual tidal disruption events as being detectable. Uh, but then the you know the the number density of the of those is much larger, so they are observationally more consistent with what we observe. I see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, George. Just posted a, a question. Um, I read it out here. We mentioned yesterday about IceCube sending alerts to telescopes, and I was wondering if there is a plan for IceCube to share data with other neutrino telescopes, P1, K3Net, GVD. Thank you for your lectures. Yes, thank you, George, for the question. So, yes, I'm not sure how this will be organized, but for sure the IceCube high energy events are already public instantly. So as soon as they get detected, there is a, a signal sent out to the entire community, which you can subscribe to by email. So that, you know, KM3Net, P1, GVD will get the signal immediately. Uh, it may be interesting to also provide more information to these telescopes eventually, and also like things like the low energy neutrinos. And this has not been organized yet because these are, not yet operating, but there are people, um, uh, certainly I'm also one of these people who are interested in Mauricio and you know, who are very interested to see this happen. So we, the data are so precious that we wanna make sure all synergies are activated. Maybe I can also comment, um, so, the, uh, we, we certainly, so from, from an IceCube perspective, because, because of, I'm an IceCube member, uh, so we, we share uh, our data with uh, all multi-messenger observatories which are interested in participating. For example, we also share this with, uh, with LIGO to look for gravitational wave, uh, wave um, events in coincidence with neutrinos. Um, so these alert events are most important for observatories which are not observing the whole sky at the same time. Uh, all these neutrino observatories like uh, P1 in the Pacific, K3Net in the Mediterranean and, and GVD in Lake Baikal, they are basically sitting there and they are taking data all the time. They're, they observe the whole sky. So if there's something interesting happen and we find this out today and it happened yesterday, <laughs> yesterday it's fine because we can always go back to our data and try to find out if there is something interesting. But for example, uh, so Ilaria, for example, was talking about the magic telescope. That's a pointing observatory and you have to look into the right direction to see the event. So for those uh, alert partnership, it's, it's, it can be very crucial that you have the information very quickly. But of course you can always afterwards share data. And we also have like joint studies with uh, Antares, which is the predecessor of KM3Net. Uh, for example, to look for a neutrino emission from our galaxy, which is a very extended emission, and so you can combine then different obser observations. Just just one uh, comment on that. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Fortini. Um, uh,
do you have the time to join us on Gather Town for the coffee break? Yes, well? I'll be here for the rest of the day. Yeah. Excellent. And uh, so before we go to uh, Gather Town, I would like uh, to, uh, so Maurizio and I would like to have also some feedback from you, the students, uh, uh, how you, if you like this, uh, the, sc the school, or I mean, in particular, if you have suggestions for improvements. So here on the, the Zoom um, chat, I'm posting right now a link to a Google form. And this is a Google form where we are going to collect uh, some comments. And this is all anonymous. Yeah, so just tell us your honest uh, uh, view. And uh, yeah, with that, uh, thank you. And I would say uh, we are reconvening at 11.20, uh, then we have about 15 minutes with uh, the topical seminar by uh, Shashek.